Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. So we'll start. Um, I'll take the paper. Give me a minute. UK, right. So uh, uh, thank, thank you for coming to this uh, uh, paper class today. So even though it's a free, uh, free paper session, so if I can see your face, it's, uh, it's nice. So it's nice to see your face. So if, if you can, please uh, switch on your camera to see your responses. And of course, uh, uh, today uh, I supposed to start the mixed mix paper revision class, but uh, uh, students were requesting me to uh, do the class after the new year. And uh, there are a lot of students still joining. So then I thought to do it uh, 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 after the new year, maybe next week. I will I'll inform the date. Uh, at the same time, I thought to do a free class today because um, if you ask your seniors, we have actually have done around eight full paper free disc, uh, eight papers free full paper discussion we have done in previous batch. So this is a normal thing to do the free paper discussion uh, uh, before the exams to prepare the students. That is one. Second thing, even for the Viva students, uh, this time I have done around thirteen free case discussion classes. So uh, further, we are going to do some. Uh, case discussion classes for uh, rest of the station as well. So this is a common thing to do this kind of free session to prepare your students in addition to the paid classes. So we are going to do uh, some paper discussion like this uh, as well as the the additional uh, uh, knowledge you will gain during our classes as well. So first of all, we, before we start uh, the class, so I, I know today morning, uh, uh, a lot of students has university lectures and things like that. So uh, I couldn't find the free time slot in the evening time. So that's why I'm supposed to do the class in the morning. So the students um, uh, who missed the class today, you don't need to worry. I will give the video access. You can go through these classes and uh, you can have some idea. That is the first uh, uh, thing. Uh, and second thing, when I'm doing the free paper session or topic wise, uh, topic wise, uh, so this uh, uh, mixed paper session as well as the topic wise revision also, I will do the restreaming of particular class on the same day night or, or maybe during the weekdays night 9:30 to 11:30. Because if if you miss some classes, you don't need to worry. You can attend to the class uh, through through the restreaming and uh, uh, hopefully we are working on the platform as well. So if platform ready, then you can join to the session through the platform. Right, and um, uh, uh, and one more small introduction. So after that, we'll go to the exam, uh, the paper. So when we are preparing the pay students to the exam, so they are, these are the setup. Full, we are going to uh, discuss this topics uh, of the, the observant gynae, of course, you studied and you complete your degree. Now you all, you all are uh, uh, graduated doctors. Uh, you are doing this exam, the ERPM exams to get the license to practice in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, uh, so so uh, actually, I couldn't see any, any student's face. I don't know whether I'm, I'm right, whether you understand or not. So it's nice to see your face, right? So please, if you can, please. It's nice to turn on your camera, right? Fine. So you are working. Uh, you are you are you are going to do the exams uh, to get the license. So uh, if you go through the, the 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 question pattern last last three years, right? So the last exam which happened in December, most of the things are based on the pathophysiological explanation and rational thinking, right? So. The, the, the traditional question pattern which you have done, which your seniors done, like uh, uh, risk factors for uh, shoulder dystrophia. So those kind of straightforward theoretical questions are nowadays it's gone, right? So if you if you see, so I'll do the last uh, ARPM paper as well. If you see the last ARPM paper, it's almost like a half half page paragraph. Right, half page paragraph. It's a big paragraph. So you need to read, you have to get the information, you need to identify the problem, then you need to find out the correct answer and, 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 and mark it. So this is how the exam, right? So the exam pattern has changed. So if and 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 there were some some myth, like your seniors were telling, so if you if you do this paper, you will get 90% of exam uh, 
questions in the exam it's not like that so there are so many new questions so so you are not supposed to be like that so you are doctors so what you have to do is you have to have that uh, background knowledge so when you go to the exam at the at the exam hall you should be able to handle the question without any difficulties so if you want to handle the question without even the question paper is very difficult you can handle the paper because if you have a good background knowledge if you know how to approach the question right so so you don't need to worry my students are going to be like that that is the normal phenomenon right so as i told you earlier also i told you right so if you go through the previous pass rate of erpm it's just 30 percentage just 30 to 35 not more than that but so my students pass rate last time around out of 350 students more than 320 got through the exam how it is possible how out of 350 more than 320 students more than 90 percentage of students got through the exam the reason is simple because those students know how to approach the question you don't need to remember the question right so there are concepts to follow if you if you know that concept so beyond that concept nothing is there so i will teach you what are the concepts right so that is how my preparation. So when you go to the exams, at the exams hall, so most of the students, previous students' uh, responses, my voice was echoing while they are doing the exam. It's, it's, it's common. You will realize it when you go to the exam. Because I will make you to prepare like that. So when you read the questions, so then my voice will echo you. Oh, right. So this is how. So this is how I need to mark. This is how I need to come to the answer. This, that, is, that is what your exam. Right, so you don't need to worry. Once you come to my class, it's my duty to make you to pass. Even though you prepared, still 90% of students got through, still that 10% failed. I really sad, but it has happened because there are so many reasons. Even you prepared well, you can't fail the exam because that is a assessment of that two hours. In that two hours, you might do, you, you, your mind is not clear. You're not concentrating. Maybe some problem, maybe some disease, Headache, or maybe maybe something like and 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 third one third third reason is some students last time they are very intelligent but they fail because while they are marking they did some mistakes so you don't don't worry I will teach those things also how to mark and how to prevent these kind of things right so and and few students fail because they came only to the paper discussion only i'm i'm telling this 350 only the students who came to the paper discussion not to the viva the theory session the students who come to the theory session and prepared well and concentrate well so don't just read the question and remember the answers so when you come to my class please concentrate how i am approaching the question how i am applying my background knowledge to the particular question and how i am rationally thinking so you will hear repeatedly the word called rational thinking because that is my word, rational thinking. Because Obzan Gaini is rational thinking. You can't be a theoretical person, just rational. Especially when you come to the Viva, you, you will realize it, it's rational. So this is an introduction about the paper class because you all are new, some students already attended, they might know. So some students might, might did the exam earlier, they might know, but the new students, the newcomers, please try to understand what is this exam. So once you understand that it's easy for you to do the exam, right? So the concept is same. Read the question, identify the problem, apply your background knowledge, rationally think and mark the answers. That, that, is, that is the way, right? I will teach you how to identify the problem, how to apply your background knowledge, how to rationally thinking and how to come to the answer. That is what we are going to do today, right? And uh, while we are doing this kind of papers, so I will I will touch some related topics as well. That is what I, I told you, mixed paper revision. So, so we are we are doing the papers or classes like this. First, first we do the theory class. That theory class is to give you a background knowledge in an extensive manner. So once you come to my class, you you will have a nice nice extended or very good background knowledge. You know because I'm I'm giving the knowledge like that. So then uh, parallelly, while we are doing the theory class, I will do the mixed paper revision. What is this mixed paper revision? The mixed paper revision is, 
So from your past papers and expected questions and some things, things like that from the exam. So I will make some papers, question papers, and we will do the paper classes with some kind of small, small, small relevant theory part. That is your mixed paper revision. So actually this mixed paper revision is going to give you an introduction or give you an idea about your, about your, this one. Uh, exam paper, how to do the exam. Theory class will give the background only. Once we finish the theory class, now we are doing the theory class. Next week we are starting stage three. So probably by end of this month, we'll finish the theory class. Once you finish the theory class, now we have studied extensively. Everyone has good knowledge. Now I start the topic wise revision by end of this month. Then in the topic wise revision, then I will revise the very important points as a theory with few questions very few questions with extensive uh, theory explanation in a points manner each and every topics will be completed within six classes that is to summarize what you have studied during the theory class so that's why a lot of students are asking why you are not starting the topic wise revision you are starting the paper mixed paper revision you are simple without finishing the theory and uh, uh, doing this topic wise revision is not not appropriate second thing the revision should be done just just maybe uh, closer to the exam you know if i do the revision right now then you have another another two months for your exam so then you might forget by the time of exam so if i start the uh, mixed paper revision so the topic wise revision by next next month first week then i'm going to revise all entire topics before the exam then it is good for you to remind them. so even viva class we have done like that so what we have done is um, we did the classes and just before the exam, I did the quick revision. So same thing, your topic wise revision is going to be like that. So before the exam to revise it, to remind you the stuff we will do. Same time with the mixed paper revision, I will do some relate, related theory as well as the question. So we will go to the exam paper. So please, what you can do is, if I send the paper, even if it is a free paper or maybe a paid, paid classes, once I send the paper, please do the paper and keep the, the answer with you. Right. So then I will do the paper. That time you can mark and put your marks. Um, marks. Right. So then just before the exam, I'll do some practice exams. So then we, we know what is your marks and what, what, what if, how you are progressing. Right. So we'll start with the MCQ first. So the MCQ, the first question is regarding the pre-labor option of membrane. Okay. So when 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 I'm asking the question, so you don't need to talk to talk to me, but you can answer through the chat so please I, I need some kind of interactive session so because um, doing lectures and doing teaching the students it's not 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 an, that much interaction so that's why even all kind of revisions this mixed paper revision exam series or topic wise revision will be like uh, live classes so theory maybe we can do the uh, hybrid session but uh, these paper revisions are going to be live class because different students has different level of questions like different level of doubt. So when we are doing questions, you have to ask, you have to discuss. So, so the classes are going to be, these paper revisions are going to be live classes, but online live classes. So you all, you all are uh, invited to ask questions. I'm expecting you to ask so many questions. So then only I can interact. Okay, right. So uh, we'll do the first MCQ. So then you should know in MCQ classes or MCQ exams, so there are two faults. If you mark correct answers, those, the, the, you will get plus one marks. If you mark wrong answer, you will get minus one marks, right? So it means your negative answers are reducing your marks. But the good thing is the negative answer, total negative answer will not carry to the next question. So even if you mark all five wrong, the total marks of the first question is minus five, but that minus five will not carry to the next question. That is only for that particular question. So, so very careful when you mark the uh, 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 MCQ. If you are quite sure, then mark it. If you are doubt or if you are bit don't know, then don't, don't mark it, right? So you don't, you are not supposed to mark each and every stems in the uh, true and false question. The reason is you will get minus marks for the negative answer. Do you understand? So don't worry. So we will we will learn those things while we are doing the class. So this time also, I'm expecting more than 90% pass rate as your seniors. I will do my level best for you for that and rest of the parties with you. Right. 
So regarding the pre-labor option of membrane, around 90% will go to the labor in 24 hours. True or false? Yes, true or false? Corticosteroids improve the neonatal outcome. True or false? Yeah, come on. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Risk of choreomniitis increased 24 hours after the PROM, pre-labor rupture of membrane. Risk of choreomniitis increased 24 hours after the PROM. True or false? Okay, true. When uh, ultrasound scan is the diagnosis, true or false? Ultrasound scan is diagnosis, true or false? False. When diagnosed with group E streptococcus, prophylactic antibiotics should be given before labor, true or false? True. Right, okay. We'll come to this question. Then I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit regarding the PROM and we'll do the MCQ. So then you can recall what we have discussed during the theory class, right? So PROM, what is the definition of PROM? This is how my uh, mixed paper revision is going. So the what is the definition of PROM is a rupture of membrane. So amniotic fluid membrane before the onset of labor. So what is the problem if the membrane got rupture before the labor? Now, the problem is she's not in labor, baby is not going to deliver immediately. If the membrane got ruptured, actually the amniotic membrane is the barrier. So the vagina is, is a, is a non-sterile organ, so which has a lot of organism. So when the barrier got ruptured, right, break, right? So this organism can easily ascend to the amniotic sac as well as the uh, placenta, as well as the fetus, as well as the endometrium. So because of that, so the placenta might get infected and which can cause infection and inflammation to the placenta and the amniotic membrane. So if it is getting infected, how do you call that? that is called chorioamniitis. So which can get infected. So because of the chorioamniitis, because of the placental infection and inflammation, blood flow to the baby will reduce. Mother will get infected. Mother will develop sepsis. So ultimately baby will die. Mother also might die. So those are the problem because of the chorioamniitis. Right. So that's why what we do is if it is P P R O M pre labor rupture of membrane, what you have to do, you have to deliver the baby because it's a labor pre labor rupture of membrane. So the membrane got ruptured before the onset of labor after 37 weeks. So another 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 condition called P P R O M. What is that P P R O M? Pre term pre labor rupture of membrane. It means membrane rupture before 37 weeks. Now here too, we have two problems. One, the baby is preterm. Second one, baby mother is not in labor. These are the two problems. But in PROM, pre-labor rupture of membrane, it's after 37 weeks. It means baby is matured, not a preterm, it's a term baby, but not in labor. So in these two problems, right? So in PPROM, if you deliver the baby immediately, baby might have some problem after the delivery because of the prematurity. So then you have to balance. Are you going to deliver the baby? Are you going to keep the baby? So if there is no complication like chorioamnitis, you can continue the pregnancy until at least 37 weeks until the baby get matured. But if the baby, if the mother got uh, infected chorioamnitis, you can't continue because if you continue, that will kill the baby, that will kill the mother. So then the complications are high. If there is a complication, immediately we deliver irrespective of the fetal maturity. So always you have to balance it. But in PROM, now it's a term baby. So in PROM, right, baby got matured already, then you don't need to wait. You are not going to achieve by keeping this baby. By, but if you keep this baby for a long time, then chances of infection is high. So here you are balancing. Is it worth to continue? Am I going to achieve something by continuing? No, but I will get some complication. So is it worth to continue? No. So then I need to deliver the baby. But if mother is not in labor. So then what you want to do, you want to, you want to uh, make the uterus to contract. You have to stimulate the labor, right? You have to stimulate the labor. So artificially creating the labor, how do you call that? If you create the labor artificially, how do you call, call that? Yeah? Very good. That is called induction of labor. That is called induction of labor. So if the mother is not in labor, what you can do, you can, uh, you can uh, induce the labor. 
you can induce the labor to stimulate the uterus to contract and expel the baby out but when you uh, when you do when you do uh, induction of labor there are some complications like fetal distress failed induction if in case of failing you may have to do the cesarean section so there are some problems there are some uh, complication due to induction so we are thinking am i going to induce the labor right now or shall i wait for some time is it used to wait for some time yes it's where used because we studied in induction of labor when you rupture the membrane when the amniotic fluid membrane or amniotic membrane got ruptured that will produce some local production of prostaglandin that prostaglandin will stimulate the labor and increase the uterine contraction and things will expel out this is what we studied do you understand so once you rupture the membrane if you can wait for 24 hours around 90 percentage of babies mothers because of the local production of prostaglandin the labor will start due to rupture of membrane so rather than stimulating the labor by yourself just wait for 24 hours around 90 percentage will start still 10 percentage of pregnancies will not commence the labor but you can't wait further because the evidence say if you wait more than 24 hours the risk of chorioamnitis will be high due to that what you want to do you want to start the labor because you can't continue this labor or pregnancy beyond 24 weeks do you understand right right and another thing you need to know there are some instances. So if, if the patient presented to you with the PROM, just wait for 24 hours, around 90% will deliver. If not, wait for 24 hours. After 24 hours, if labor not commence, just start the Sinto or just put the prostaglandin and induce the labor and deliver it. This is how we are doing. But there are some instances, there are some indications. You can't wait for these 24 hours. The reason is, when you wait for that 24 hours, it is a risk for the mother and baby, such as group B streptococcal infection. Right? What is this group B streptococcal infection? It is a commensal organism which is present in the maternal maternal uh, vagina. So that can cause fetal infection, right? mainly fetal infection. So if you if if the mother has that particular organism in the vagina, if we know that due to some other reason, one, once we got to know, if the mother is having group B streptococcal infection, when the membrane got rupture, that group B streptococcal infection bacteria can ascend and cause fetal infection. So as we know this is a risk to the baby, immediately we are delivering the baby. So group B streptococcal colonization in the vagina is an indication for early induction. That is one, okay? Second, if the mother is HIV positive, or oh, if the mother is group, uh, uh, hepatitis B positive, if the mother is uh, 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 human uh, HBV positive, so no, that uh, human herpes simplex virus positive. So this kind of infection positive mothers, once the membrane got rupture, mother to child transmission is a bit high. So then you can't wait, you may have to induce the labor immediately rather than waiting for 24 hours. So now you, 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 even though you are you are inducing immediately for the group B streptococcal infection, still you want to reduce the chance of getting the infection to the baby. What you can do for that, you can give the antibiotic prophylaxis to minimize the chance. So if the mother has kind of H, uh, uh, group B streptococcal colonization, so we are doing immediate induction at the same time, you need to start the IV antibiotic to prevent the infection. Now, almost within these five minutes or 10 minutes, I have covered each and every important point related to the PROM. Now, after discussing this background knowledge, these are the things we have discussed already in the theory class. Anyhow, I have summarized quickly. After discussing these things, we'll come to the question again. Regarding PROM or pre-labor rupture of membrane, around 90% will go to labor in 24 hours. Yeah, that's true. That is what we studied. Corticosteroids improve the neonatal outcome. Now the question is, corticosteroids uh, improve the neonatal outcome? That's true. 
for the normal. Now, the question is regarding pre labor rupture of membrane. If it is a pre labor rupture of membrane, are we giving corticosteroids? If it is because the baby is term, baby is term, not preterm. Are you all hearing me? Yeah. Is it clear? Okay, thank you. Right. So here it's term. Right? It's term. So if it is a term baby, will you want to give the corticosteroids for the PROM? No. Right? So the lung maturity will not be there for the preterm labor. So in case of preterm labor, the corticosteroids will improve the neonatal outcome. There is no question. But if it is a term baby, actually, that will not improve your neonatal outcome. So for this question, right? So the statement is correct. Corticosteroid improve the neonatal outcome. Statement is correct. There is no question on that, right? The statement is correct. But for particular question, this statement is not going to be correct. The regarding pre labor rupture of membrane means for the term baby. Are we giving corticosteroids for the term baby? No. You don't need to give. The term babies, you don't need to give. Okay. For the term baby, corticosteroids are not 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 useful. So for this statement, it's false for particular question. So you have to keep that in your mind. Corticosteroids always improve the neonatal outcome. There is no question. But for particular this question regarding the pre labor rupture of membrane, this is a term baby. We are not giving, right? Regarding pre labor rupture, corticosteroids improve the neonatal outcome? No. If it is a PPROM, corticosteroids improve the neonatal outcome. True or false? Then it's true. If it is preterm pre labor rupture of membrane, then corticosteroid is improving the neonatal outcome. That's correct. But yeah, okay. Risk of choreomniotis is increased 24 hours after the PROM. Yeah, you, you know that, right? That's why we are inducing after 24 hours. Ultrasound scan is used to diagnose. No, ultrasound scan will not help to diagnose. The diagnosis is like a examination, history and examination. You just put the speculum and see whether the fluid is coming where you can check whether fluid is in the posterior phonics, right? And uh, you can do the vaginal examination, whether, whether the membrane is intact, but until the labor start, the vaginal examination is not recommended or it's contraindicated because we are inoculating the organism into the endometrium. That's why they are not recommending the vaginal examination until the labor start. And uh, uh, there, are some, there are some investigations available to confirm the uh, 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 rupture of membrane, but usually we don't do that investigations for the term labies. But if it is a PPROM, you can do some investigations that will help you to diagnose the PPROM. Can anyone tell what are those two investigations which help you to diagnose the PPROM? These are the MCQ points. Anyone? There are two I have taught you. What are those two investigations will help you to diagnose the PPROM? Anyone? Right, growth, growth hormone, uh, yeah, gro uh, uh, growth hormone uh, binding uh, globu protein, yeah, and one more. I mean, not sure nowadays we don't use. Another one is placental microglobulin, right? PM, PMG, yes, placental microglobulin. Those are the two investigation will help you to diagnose the PPROM, but. For the term baby, we don't do because anyhow we are going to induce the labor. Okay. Ultrasound scan is used to diagnose. That is uh, false. When the diagnosed with a group B streptococcus, prophylactic antibiotics should be given before labor. Yeah, that's true. So answers, um, uh, now you know, right? So true, false, true, false, true. Right. Second, regarding dysfunctional uterine bleeding associated with anovulatory cycle. Quick, we have 20 questions to discuss. 
uh, is in during labor antibiotic for gbs actually what we are doing immediate induction no so once the patient got admitted if the patient is uh, uh, group is streptococcal uh, colonized give the antibiotic prophylaxis and start the induction that's it right okay so uh, regarding dysfunctional uterine bleeding associated with anovulatory cycle true or false true okay we'll see it is it is a cause for the enlarged uterus to diagnose by mri false improved by dilatation of the cervix and curettage dnc false treated with progestin containing iucd treated with uh, marina coil falls okay of course um, uh, now now around around 100 students are following my theory session right now so uh, this the menorrhagia topic will be discussed in stage 3 so some students didn't uh, discuss uh, didn't know about this uh, abnormal dysfunctional uterine bleeding dub but anyhow some students already attended and they know the stuff anyhow i'm 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 uh, uh, summarizing very quickly and then you will get to know so can anyone tell what is dysfunctional uterine bleeding so what are the causes for the uterine bleeding abnormal uterine bleeding so you might heard that the figo classification for the abnormal uterine bleeding what is abnormal uterine bleeding abnormal uterine bleeding is abnormality in the menstrual bleeding in frequency duration and flow abnormality in the menstrual bleeding in frequency duration and flow so any kind of abnormality whether it, it might be high it might be low it might be prolonged it might be shortened it might be uh, very frequent it might be infrequent so any kind of abnormalities can cause the abnormal uterine bleeding so what are the causes for the abnormal uterine bleeding there are two 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 kind of causes one is structural cause another one is functional cause one is structural cause another one is functional cause the structural cause you can easily remember like palm p a l m what is that palm polyp adenomyosis leiomyoma or fibroid and malignancy p a l m palm right p a l m that is palm that is polyp adenomyosis leiomyoma and malignancy then coin coagulopathy that is functional something problem in the coagulation functional or ovulation ovulatory problem right e endometrial dysfunction endometrial dysfunction right not classified yet right so there are there are there are causes so some causes are like uh, uh, structural cause some causes are like functional cause but then what is this dysfunctional uterine bleeding so the name itself is saying dysfunction dysfunctional uterine bleeding so here the dysfunction of endometrium the endometrium is not functioning properly because endometrium has a role to control your bleeding or regulate your menstrual bleeding endometrial function so as we see this coin so this palm coin this endometrial dysfunction can be a cause of functional cause for the abnormal uterine bleeding so that dysfunctional uterine bleeding is dysfunction of the endometrium not the other cause this is not the uh, polyp this is not the uh, leiomyoma this is not the adenomyosis this is not the malignancy this is not the ovulatory problem right this is not the iatrogenic causes this is this is problem with the endometrial dysfunction usually these endometrial dysfunctions are common around the menopause these endometrial dysfunctions are common around the menopause right so dub so the problem is with your endometrial dysfunction do you have any measures to assess the endometrial function no we don't have you can't assess the endometrial function you can assess the endometrial structure you can assess the abnormality like fibroid polyp malignancy take the biopsy but we don't have any measures to assess the endometrial function we don't know whether endometrium is functioning properly or improperly 
So then how to diagnose this dysfunctional uterine bleeding? Because as we don't have any method to assess or identify the dysfunction, this, this will be diagnosed as diagnosis of exclusion. Diagnosis of exclusion. You exclude all the causes. You exclude all the causes. You have excluded, you have excluded uh, uh, the structural causes. You have excluded the uh, uh, functional causes like uh, 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 ovulatory dysfunction and all. You have excluded everything. Once you exclude, you don't know. Still, she's having abnormal bleeding. So it could be due to dysfunction of the endometrium. So diagnosis of dysfunctional uterine bleeding is a diagnostic exclusion. Diagnostic exclusion. Do you understand? This is how we are excluding or we are diagnosing the dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Now, we know this is a functional problem with the endometrium. So if you want to treat this bleeding, what are the options available? One, you need to suppress the endometrium. There is no option because endometrium is not functioning properly. So you have to suppress the endometrium. How can you suppress the endometrium? You can stop the ovulation. Once you stop the ovulation, once you stop the ovulation, there is no, no estrogen, no progestin that will, that will uh, suppress the endometrium. That is one. Second, you can give the progestin that progestin will suppress the endometrial growth. So the progestin can be given. So progestin can be given through the oral or maybe through the local. Local one, you are inserting the IUCD with the locally releasing progestin that is called LNG IUS or Marina. Levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system that is called LNG IUS. You can put the IUCD into the endometrium that will release the progestin into the local area that, that will suppress the endometrium. So then endometrium is suppressed atrophy then it won't bleed that is second third one you can take the endometrium out you can resect the endometrium out that is called endometrial ablation or endometrial resection you can do fourth one you can take the uterus out so there are options but when you come to the question depend on the other factors you can decide which one you are going to do it okay so these are the management option. Now we can come to the question again. We'll see the true or false regarding dysfunctional uterine bleeding associated with anovulatory cycle. True or false? Now answer please. Dysfunctional uterine bleeding is associated with uh, anovulatory cycle. True or false? True or false? What, what do you understand by an ovulatory cycle? An ovulatory cycle means the ovulation is not, not occurring. That's why they are having a, a bleeding problem. So if it is a dysfunctional uterine bleeding, if it is a, ut a dysfunctional uterine bleeding, then it can't be a ovulatory dysfunction. Give me one minute. Can't be an ovulatory dysfunction as we discuss now, because if it is an ovulatory dysfunction, then you can't diagnose the dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Dysfunctional uterine bleeding is an exclusion of the other causes. There is no ovulatory dysfunction. There is no structural causes. There is no iatrogenic causes. There is no malignancy. Once you every, exclude everything, only you can say dysfunctional uterine bleeding. But here they have mentioned. Uh, uh, associated with an ovulatory cycle. So if it is associated with an ovulatory cycle, then it is not a dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So that's false. It is a cause for the enlarged uterus. No, because there is no reason for the enlargement of uterus because it's a problem with the endometrium, not with the uterus. It's problem with the endometrium, not with the uterus. That is false. Diagnosed by MRI? No, false. I told you there is no diagnostic modality for this dysfunctional uterine bleeding. There is no uh, diagnostic modality for the dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Improved by dilatation and curatage. No. DNC, it's, it's not going to be a treatment option. Dark, dilatation and curatage is a diagnostic modality to take the biopsy from the endometrium. Okay. And uh, treated with progestin containing IUCD. Yeah, that's true. That's what we studied. So, 
uh, second question false 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 true in miss miscarriage uterine size is less than the period of amenorrhea true or false coagulopathy is recognized complication to patient commonly present with hyperemesis gravidarum false viral infection is a causative factor two cervical cyclage is recommended in subsequent pregnancies false okay right now what is miss miscarriage what are you going to what what you understand by miss miscarriage so the miss miscarriage is the pregnancy is there but the pregnancy is uh, 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 it's not a healthy one the growth of the baby is not not adequate the fetal growth is not enough right that's why the pregnancy has missed right pregnancy has missed missed so if the pregnancy missed if the pregnancy is unhealthy if the baby is not growing well what do you think about the uterine size it's going to be smaller than the expected because it, the baby is not a healthy one it's not growing well second if the baby is not growing well that baby will not produce adequate amount of hcg so if there is lack of hcg what do you think about the symptoms of pregnancy like vomiting nausea what do you think because nausea and vomiting during pregnancy is basically due to this hcg when you have less hcg what will happen so the vomiting chance will be less so do you think this is present commonly with the uh, uh, hyperemesis gravidarum no so the chances to have vomiting is less not not commonly and third one so why this miss miscarriage occur why this pregnancy failed to grow because there are some major chron chronological abnormalities chromosomal abnormality major congenital abnormality so whatever the condition which lead major chromosomal or congenital abnormality which can affect the fetal growth and ultimately pregnancy might loss which can affect the pregnancy and ultimately pregnancy might last do you understand so if it is a miscarriage then this pregnancy is not going to be a healthy pregnancy you have to remove this pregnancy out so there are management options for this uh, uh, miss pregnancy one you can wait for another two weeks spontaneously this uh, unhealthy pregnancy will be expelled out by the uterus that is one second you can make the uterus to contract to expelled out how to make the uterus to contract you can insert some medication to make the uterus to contract that is your mesoprostol that is your medical management third one you can take the product which is inside the unhealthy pregnancy product to uh, take it out so that is that is your surgical management that is called dilatation and ev evacuation d and e so the difference between d and c and d and e, d and c you are dilate, dilating the cervix and taking the sample or endometrial sample that is curatage dilatation is evacuation d and e we are dilating and taking the pregnancy part out that is called d and e so d and e and d and c is totally different both are not same okay now here the question is in miss miscarriage uterine size is less than the period of amenorrhea obviously because this pregnancy is not a healthy pregnancy so then uterine size should be less than the period of um, amenorrhea coagulopathy is recognized complication what do you think about coagulopathy is recognized complication usually coagulopathy it's not a recognized complication right so it can occur if the patient developed uh, uh, if if the patient develop uh, bleeding right if the patient develop bleeding can cause coagulopathy right but if the miss pregnancy is inside which is causing uh, coagulopathy always it's it's not right coagulopathy is recognized complication we can't say true right okay that's false patient commonly present i'm hyperemesis gravidarum no it's not commonly less chance of vomiting that's false viral infection is causative factor yeah that's true because some viral infection can cause congenital abnormality and chromosomal abnormality like 
rubella, torch infections, right? So rubella can cause congenital abnormalities, so then pregnancy might fail and miscarriage can be a present. So viral infection is, an, uh, is a causative factor. Yeah, that's true. Cervical cerclage is recommended in subsequent pregnancy. What is cervical cerclage? We are putting the stitch in the cervix to strengthen the cervix. Strengthen the cervix. We need to strengthen the cervix. Why we want to strengthen the cervix? In the cervix is, if the cervix is not strengthened, when the baby grow, baby might come out. That is called cervical incompetence. That is called cervical incompetence. So mother who has cervical incompetence, you need to put the cerclage in subsequent pregnancy to strengthen the cervix, right? So how, how to diagnose the cervical incompetence? Usually the cervical incompetence pregnancy loss usually occur in second trimester, not in first trimester, right? Not in first trimester. So uterine size is less than the period of amenorrhea. Uh, that is false. Coagulopathy is uh, the true. Coagulopathy is recognized complication false. Patient commonly present with hyperemesis, um, it's false. Viral infection is causative factor. Cervical cerclage is recommended in subsequent pregnancy. So the cervical cerclages are rec recommended for the cervical incompetence, not for the mis miscarriage. That is false. So question number four, regarding operative vaginal delivery, keffel hematoma is a complication in vacuum delivery. True or false? Keffel hematoma, it's a complication of vacuum delivery. True. For sep used in obstructed labor, Forceps used in obstructed labor. Keel and forceps is used to deliver the occipital transverse position. Forceps delivery is contraindicated in face presentation. Forceps delivery. Vacuum is the instrument of choice for the fetal head is in is, is that ischial spine. Right, I think we have discussed this uh, instrumental delivery earlier also. So regarding the operative delivery, so then first of all, you need to know what is operative or assisted vaginal delivery when the vaginal delivery is getting delayed we need to assist to deliver the baby. That is called assisted vaginal delivery. That, that is called assisted vaginal delivery. So uh, there are different type of assisted vaginal delivery. One is vacuum and another one is forceps. So you can classify the assisted vaginal delivery into four. One is, uh, 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 one is, uh, 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 high cavity, mid cavity, low cavity, and outlet. High cavity, mid cavity, low cavity, and outlet. What do you understand by outlet forceps delivery? Outlet forceps delivery, so without separating the labia, if you can see the fetal part or fetal head, that is out, outlet, right? If the baby's head is uh, Above the level of ischial spine, that is high cavity. If the baby said this below the level of ischial spine, but not more than two centimeter below, from zero to plus two station is mid cavity. From plus two station to introitus is low cavity. At the introitus is outlet. This is how we are categorizing. Okay, this is how we are categorizing. So high cavity deliveries are not recommended. There is no, no high cavity instrumental delivery. If the fetal head is below ischial spine only, if the fetal head is below ischial spine only, you can, you can use the uh, forceps delivery or vacuum delivery, whatever. Right? So below ischial spine only, you can use the vacuum instrument. So if the if the fetal head is above the ischial spine, you can't, you can't apply the skills of instrumental delivery. Okay, right. So then when you, when you see the instrument, type of instruments, so the vacuum, there are different type of vacuum like kiwi cup, metal cup, plastic cup, there, there are different type of vacuum. And when you, when you talk about the forceps, so different, different uh, uh, category has uh, uh, different, different instruments. Like if it is an outlet, outlet delivery, 
the forceps which we are using for the outlet delivery is rectal forceps, right? Rectal forceps. If it is a low cavity delivery, the forceps which we are using is um, Simpson's forceps and Neville band forceps, right? If it is a mid cavity, you can use Simpson's, you can use Neville band, you can use key lamp. But the key lamp forceps has another advantage. What is that advantage? So to deliver the baby, baby should be either in an occipital anterior or occipital posterior position. So baby should be in an occipital anterior or occipital posterior position. If it is in the occipital anterior or occipital posterior only, you can put the forceps like this and take the baby out. But if the baby is in occipital transverse, when you are putting the forceps, the forceps will cover over the baby's face and it can damage to the baby's face. It can damage to the baby's face. That's why what you want to do, you want to rotate the baby to occipital transverse, right? So this is, this is the baby's occipital anterior, occipital posterior. If the, if the baby is uh, like this, occipital anterior and posterior, you can put the forceps and deliver the baby like this. If the baby in occipital transverse position, this is the baby's backside, this is the baby's front side. When you put the forceps here and here, the forceps one blade will damage the baby's face. You can't put the forceps. So then first of all, what you want to do, you want to turn the baby to occipital anterior or posterior position. Then only you can deliver the baby then only you can deliver the baby. Do you understand? Right? So, the first of all, what you have to do, you have to turn the baby. You have to turn the baby. So, that is called rotational forceps. So, key length forceps is rotational forceps, which we are using for the occipital transverse position. But vacuum, you can use uh, even occipital transverse, occipital uh, uh, anterior, occipital posterior, even outlet mid cavity, low cavity, but not for the high cavity. What are the indications for the instrumental delivery? There are fetal indication, there are maternal indication. What are the fetal indication? Fetal distress, right? Fetal distress, urgent delivery. You need to deliver the baby immediately. Some maternal. What are the maternal in, uh, indication? Prolonged second stage. After fully dilatation, baby is not delivering, it's getting time, prolonged second stage. Oh. So what are the other, other thing? Maternal exhaustion. Mother got tired or oh, more, I can't do, I can't strain. Maternal exhaustion. Some condition, mother can't strain. Cardiac disease complicating pregnancy. Diabetic proliferative net, ne, re, retinopathy, right? Masthenia gravis, hypertensive emergency, or severe preeclampsia. You can't, you have to use the instrument. So there are indications for the instruments, instrumental delivery. If it is an obstructed labor, baby couldn't come through the birth canal. Can you, so prolonged labor due to obstructed labor, can you put the forceps? No, because the space is not adequate to come the baby out. So with the inadequate space, if you put the instrument and pull out, what will happen? Acclimately, either baby or mother will get damaged. A, the baby or mother will get damaged. Do you understand? So obstructed labor, it's contraindicated for the instrumental delivery. There are so many things to discuss in instrumental delivery. I can't explain each and everything in this question when we are doing so specific indication for the forceps. Then when we are doing that question, we will revise it like that. Okay. Now we'll come to the um, uh, stems. Kefal hematoma is a complication in vacuum delivery. That is true because when you are using the negative pressure over the head, so when it is suck out, there, there will be some blood collection here. That is called kefal hematoma, right? That is true. For self used to obstructed labor, that is false. You can't use the uh, instrument for the obstructed labor because it can fetal and maternal damage. That is false. Keel and forceps is used to deliver the occipital transverse position. Yeah, that's true. Forceps delivery is contraindicated in face presentation. That is false. Forceps delivery is recommended for the face delivery. You can't use the vacuum delivery for the face presentation. Why? Because the face presentation means the presenting part is face. So when the face is there, if you can if you can apply the vacuum over the face, the negative pressure over the face. So then it will not fix properly. That is one. Second thing, you can't give the negative pressure over the fetal eyeballs. So then. Uh, face face presentation is contraindicated for the vacuum delivery. 
if it is a face presentation only you can deliver with the forceps not with the vacuum so forceps delivery is contraindicated for the face presentation that is false that is the recommended one and vacuum is the instrument of choice for the fetal head at ischial spine so if the baby actually this question is a past paper question this question is kind of a odd question if it is at the level of ischial spine so it's almost like a um, uh, uh, high cavity not high cavity the, the mid cavity so if it is a mid cavity you can go for a, a, a vacuum you can go for a, a, a keeland or or maybe a simpson neville band so mid cavity one you can go but here they have mentioned vacuum is the instrument of instrument choice choice that word is the problem instrument choice it means if the baby's head is at the level of ischial spine you have to go for vacuum it's not like that so that's why it's false right so the answer for question number 4 two false two false false right the next question indication for ring pessary so what is ring pessary when there is a ue prolapse so you can support the ue prolapse in a conservative manner you can manage you can elevate the uh, 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 descended uterus to the upper position so for that we are using the pessary there are two kind of pessary one is supporting pessary second one is self occupy sorry space occupying pessaries what is supporting pessary this supporting pessary will elevate the uterus in a higher position and giving some support what is uh, 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 space occupying pessary you just put the uterus inside and put the pessary inside that will occupy the entire vagina so that nothing will come out nothing will come out that is called self occupying pessary so what is the supporting pessary can you tell some example of supporting pessary please can you tell some example of supporting pessary have we discussed the ue prolapse yeah we have yes what is supportive pessary any any example of supportive pessary now when you do the mcq you might understand even though you study it your way of study is not pointed towards the question that's why we need to do the paper discussion so when we are doing the paper discussion we are just targeting or we are just diverting our background knowledge towards the questions right background knowledge towards the question so what is uh, A supportive pessary. Supportive pessary is a ring pessary. We just put the ring like pessary, elevate and and keep there. So then it will keep the uterus in in a higher position. That is ring pessary. Then the space occupying pessary. Have you heard shelf pessary? Have you heard shelf pessary? Shelf pessary is a space occupying pessary, right? So what is the advantage and disadvantage of the ring pessary and shelf occupying pessary? So if it is a ring pessary actually your vaginal orifice is still patent so patient can have sexual intercourse but if it is a shelf pessary space occupying pessary you are obliterating the vaginal orifice there is no vagina so then they can't have sexual life those are the problem with self pessary right now why you want to put the pessary why can't you do the, what is the definitive management for the you will perhaps is the surgery why are we not doing surgery we are we are going for a conservative management is there any option for the surgery or why what is the indication for the conservative management the indication for the conservative management uh, one if the patient not willing for the surgery you need to go for the conservative management or sometime you might give the exam or uh, surgery date but it took time you need some time because of the theater list so already the pending list is there so she might uh, she may have to wait for another 2 or 3 months to to get the surgery date right so during that time she can't be with the uterus outside the vagina so you can you can put the pessary until her uh, cervix is uh, or the the surgery date achieved right third one patient is not fit for the surgery severe heart disease you can't operate so then until she die just put the pessary and give some symptomatic relief fourth one if you are planning to do surgery right sometime there might be some ulcers due to uh, venous congestion 
so if it is an ulcers due to venous congestion you need to release the venous congestion to make the uterus so ulcer to heal to release it you need to push the uterus bit higher up so if there is an ulcers due to venous congestion you need to put them and sometime patient might have uh, uh, uv prolapse during the pregnancy so when the pregnancy advances uterus will enlarge and uterus will come to the upper side so that time the uv prolapse will improve so until the uterus enlarge you need to keep the uterus in higher position so early part of the pregnancy you may have to put the pessary because you can't operate during pregnancy right these are the indication for the ring pessary so now we will come to that question here again indication for the ring pessary urge incontinence due to detrosal instability there is no use because urge incontinence mean uterus so the detrosal muscle is unnecessarily contracting that's why she is leaking so in that case putting pessary will not help that is false enterocele actually enterocele will not be removed or uh, will not be uh, relieved by the pessary that is false uv prolapse in pregnancy yeah that's true yeah that's true and uv prolapse with decubitus ulcers but not in the ring ulcers yeah that is true because if it is a decubitus ulcers due to venous congestion we need to put the ring pessary and hypertrophic elongation of the cervix what do you understand by hypertrophic elongation of the cervix hypertrophic elongation of the cervix means uterus is not descend uterus is in the normal position but the cervix is hypertrophied and coming out do you understand that is called hypertrophic elongation of the cervix there is no uterine descent but the cervix is outside because the cervix is enlarging elongation elongated so in that case if it is a descent you can push the uterus and put the pessary now here there is no descent this is a hypertrophic elongation so will it help what do you think no only option you need to cut the elongated part and repair it that is what is what is the name of the surgery for that if it is a hypertrophic elongation you need to cut the part of cervix and repair it what is the name of the surgery that is anyone come on manchester repair very good that is called manchester repair right so if the if the cervix is elongated if it's enlarged so you just cut the part of your cervix and remove it and repair it that is called manchester repair that is called manchester repair right so in hypertrophic elongation you don't need to put the ring pessary that is false so answer for question number 5 false false two true false right next one the question number 6 causes for the anovulatory infertility so what is infertility inability to conceive inability to become pregnant after one year of unprotected sexual intercourse inability to conceive after one year of unprotected sexual vaginal sexual intercourse right so what could be the reason for that so could be due to male factor problem or female factor problem male factor problem or female factor problem so in female factor problem what are the causes for the infertility could be due to ovulatory problem could be due to uterine factors u uterine problems could be due to tubal problems could be due to vaginal problems so there are several several reasons for the infertility so among these factors what are the causes for the anovulation so in anovulation or ovulatory problem which is leading to infertility means that particular mother is not ovulating properly so what are the factors determining the ovulation one as we know oh if you don't know doesn't matter we are going to study those things in stage 3 by next week right in the menstrual cycle the ovulation is under control of hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis ovulation is under control of hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis hypothalamus will secrete the gnrh then pituitary will secrete the fsh and lh and under influence of fsh and lh the ovary will develop the follicles and follicle will release as the ovum so if you have any problem in this hypothalamo pituitary ovary axis problem in the hypothalamus problem in the pituitary 
problem in the ovary can cause anovulative fertility, right? So hypothalamic infection, stress, right? Uh, anorexia nervosa, right? Sudden weight gain, sudden weight loss, hypothalamic surgeries can cause hypothalamic failure. Or maybe Sheehan syndrome or infection, tumors of the pituitary right, can cause uh, hypothalamic problems. Or ovarian failure, PCOS, premature ovarian failure. Right? So which can cause ovulatory problems. So in addition to this hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis, there are some hormones which interfere the ovulation. Can you just tell me what are the other hormones which interfere the ovulation? One is prolactin, another one is thyroxine, third one is insulin. So if the patient has hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, can cause ovulatory dysfunction. If the patient is having prolactinoma or hyperprolactinism, so high level of prolactin, which can interfere the ovulation. Or insulin, diabetes can interfere the ovulation. So any condition from this hormone can cause an ovulation. With this background knowledge, we'll come to this question. Causes for an ovulatory suffering the endometriosis. So endometriosis is the problem in the peritoneum. What is endometriosis? Endometriosis is presence of endometrial tissue outside the endometrial cavity. Presence of endometrial tissue outside the endometrial cavity. Because of that, which can cause inflammation, which can cause adhesions, which can cause uh, uh, tubal narrowing, which can cause tubal obstruction, right? Which can cause severe pain. So there are other problems. So the endometriosis can cause tubal factor, but it does not have much effect on the ovulation, right? So endometriosis can't be a cause for the anovulatory subfertility. That is false. Obesity, of course, that is the major problem among these girls nowadays. Obesity can cause anovulation, right? So if you, if you, yeah, P cause and obesity, which can cause uh, anovulation. So if you see almost more than 70 percentage of obese girls does not have regular period, right? When you come to the clinicals, you will understand almost more than 70 percentage of obese girl will not have regular period. They will have irregular period, maybe infrequent period, once in two months, once in three months, once they get the period, it lasts for two weeks, three weeks, right? So obesity can cause anovulation. That's why they don't have uh, regular bleeding. Pelvic inflammatory disease. What do you think about the pelvic inflammatory disease? Yeah. So the pelvic inflammatory disease does not have any effect on the ovulation, but which can cause the effect like endometriosis, like addition, tubal stenosis, tubal narrowing, and things like that. Right, so um, uh, PID, yes, polycystic ovarian, PID, no, PID does not have any anovulation, that is false. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, yeah, PCOS, the problem, what is the polycystic ovarian syndrome, what is the problem in polycystic PCOS? In PCOS, the follicles are start to develop, but not maturing, right? Follicles are start to develop, but not maturing. So then th there is no ovulation. So which can cause um, uh, which can which can cause anovulatory subfertility? Around ninety percentage of anovulatory subfertility is due to PCOS. Keep it in your mind when we are studying subfertility. I will teach you. Around ninety percentage unfertility. So anovulatory subfertility is due to PCOS. And prolactinoma. Yes, we discuss about prolactinoma. Prolactin will inhibit the hypothalamic secretion of GnRH and FSH and FSH action on the ovary, everything to suppress the ovulation because that is a natural contraception. You know, when the mother is breastfeeding for a baby, until the baby grown, she should not become pregnant. That's why the goat create like this. When she is breastfeeding, there will be a prolactin. That prolactin will suppress the ovulation. There is no ovulation, so she can't become pregnant. How do you call? That is called lactational amenorrhea. That is called lactational amenorrhea. It means when she is breastfeeding, she can't become pregnant. Okay, there are questions asked by the students. 
So what about endometrioma? Can't it cause subfertility? What is endometrioma? Endometrioma is endometriotic uh, lesions in the ovary, which can cause uh, uh, which can cause uh, the the blood collection in the ovary. Right. So the endometrioma can cause severe abdominal pain and tumor. You may have to remove the uh, uh, endometrioma. But if you read the guidelines and books, they mention the endometrioma will not affect the follicular development. It won't cause an ovulation. There will be an ovulation, but the ovum which is produced with the endometrioma, the quality of the ovum might be low, but it won't cause an ovulation. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question, right. Endometrioma implantation disorder, not, 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 not really implantation disorder, which can cause uh, low quality egg. Uh, and uh, so as it is endometrioma, it can have some addition with the tube and tubal narrowing, tubal motility problem, ectopic pregnancy, right? So those are the problem with the endometrioma, right? So uh, the answer for question number six, uh, false, true, false, true, true. Question number seven, condition causing low platelet. So this is a straightforward question. You should know the condition which can cause low platelet. Chronic diabetes, actually chronic diabetes will not cause low platelet directly. So that is false. Sickle cell anemia, in sickle cell anemia, platelet, uh, nothing will happen to the platelet count. So that is false. Help syndrome, yeah. What is help syndrome? Hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, and low platelet. It is a complication of pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia. It is a complication of pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia. So, there are three things in HELP syndrome. One is hemolysis. Second one is LP, low, uh, elevated uh, EL, elevated liver enzyme, and low platelet. So that's that's why we call it as HELP. H means hemolysis. EL means elevated liver enzyme. Another LP means low platelet. So the name itself is saying which can cause low platelet. So that is true. Severe preeclampsia. Again, severe preeclampsia can cause... Uh, low platelet, no worries. I will explain you the pathophysiology of uh, low platelet in your PIH class because of the endothelial activation, the platelet will aggregate and form small, small, small clots and utilization of the platelet will cause uh, thrombocytopenia. At the same time, disseminated manner, you will develop a lot of coagulation. So that is that can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. So preeclampsia, can cause low platelet, elevated liver enzymes, right? DIC and a lot of complications. So preeclampsia, it is a cause for the low platelet. That is true. Third one is ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Yeah, again, that can cause low platelet. So answer for question number seven, false, false, true, true, true. Right. Question number eight, no need to give rogum in RH negative mother. So why we are giving rogum for a RH negative mother? Because if the baby is RH uh, positive, if the mother is RH negative, when the fetal RH positive blood enter into the maternal circulation, maternal immune system will stimulate and produce the antibody, right? That is called fetal maternal hemorrhage. That fetal maternal hemorrhage from fetus to mothers, so the veto maternal hemorrhage can stimulate the maternal immune system. So the mother will produce the antibody against the RH positive blood because mother does not have RH positive. So as this mother develop antibody against RH positive blood, this antibody will cross the placenta to enter into the maternal circulation, to enter into the maternal circulation, sorry, fetal circulation. So this antibody will destroy the fetal RBC. Ultimately, fetal hemoglobin will be low. Baby will develop heart failure. So then ultimately baby will develop height of fetalis and fetal death. This is a problem with the RH ISO immunization. So what you want to do once the mother develop antibody, you can't prevent the antibody transfer through the placenta because until the baby inside, definitely the material will go through the placenta. So if you want, you have to deliver the baby, but you can't deliver the baby at 20 weeks. So you need to continue the pregnancy. So the only way what you can do, you can prevent the mother to Produce the antibody. You can prevent the sensitization. That is the only way you can do. Just to prevent the sensitization. That is the only way you can do. Do you understand? So how can you prevent the sensitization? Whenever fetal maternal hemorrhage occur, whenever the fetal blood enter into the maternal circulation, just give the rogum. 
So what is rogum? This rogum will destroy the fetal blood which is present in the maternal blood. So when you give the rogum, the rogum will destroy the fetal blood from the maternal circulation. Once it's destroyed, then maternal immune system will not recognize the fetal antibody, fetal blood cells, and there, will, there won't be any antibody production. So when the mother is sensitized, will it be affect the subsequent pregnancy only? Will it also affect the ongoing pregnancy? No. Ongoing pregnancy will not affect because of the current pregnancy sensitization. Only it will affect the subsequent pregnancy. The reason is very simple. The reason is this. When an immune system sensitized again an antibody, immediately the antibody type is going to be IgM. Right? This IgM is large molecules. So those large molecular IgM will not cross the placenta. So this, even though mother sensitizes in ongoing pregnancy, that antibody will not cross the placenta, will not cause any effect to the baby. But after six months, this IgM will convert to IgG. This IgG type of antibodies are smaller molecules, which can easily cross the placenta. So after sensitizing event, after six months, mother is going to develop antibody IgG, this antibody can cross the placenta and which will cause hemolysis of the baby and causing, causing fetal anemia. So that's why as you ask iPhone, uh, you know, I'm teaching to the iPhone and all, so please put your real name, right? So uh, that is, that's why so this sensitization will not affect the current pregnancy, only will affect the subsequent, uh, concert, the, the subsequent pregnancy. Right. So here, to prevent the uh, sensitization, what you have to do is you have to give the rogum to prevent sensitization. So when are we going to give the sense of rogum? So when there is a sensitizing event. So there are five events in the first trimester can cause sensitization. There are some other events after the first trimester can cause sensitizing event. So if you know those sensitizing event, whenever a patient presented to you with the sensitizing event, immediately you have to give the rogum to prevent the sensitization. Right, so what are the indications for the sensitized uh, rogum? One, in first trimester there are five. One, recurrent threatened miscarriage. Second, threatened miscarriage with abdominal pain. Third one, surgical management of miscarriage. Fourth one, ectopic pregnancy. Fifth one, partial tropoblastic disease. Those are the five indications in first trimester. Right, what are the other indications in second trimester and third trimester? Any kind of miscarriage in second trimester, antepartum hemorrhage, any invasive procedure to the mother like amniocentesis, codosynthesis, chorionic villus sampling, whatever the invasive procedure, right? And third one is external cephalic version, blunt abdominal trauma, any kind of delivery, whether it's instrumental delivery, normal vaginal delivery, cesarean section, any kind of delivery. These are the indications for roga. Other than this, you don't need to give the roga. Okay, now we'll discuss the question. So no need to give roga if already given in antenatal period. Now, mother come to the labor room, already she received the roga. Now she's delivering. Will you give the roga or not? Already she received the rogum during the antenatal period, maybe 35 weeks. Now she's delivering at 37 weeks. Will you give the rogum? Will you give or not? Answer, yes or no. You need to give. You need to give. The reason is why you have given the rogum earlier to neutralize the previous event. Once you give the rogum to the previous event, that rogum has been utilized to neutralize it. Now you don't have any rogum, the, the, the existing rogum in the maternal body. Now, when she's delivering right now, she's getting additional fetal blood into her blood. 
you need to neutralize that new fetal blood. You have to give rogam. There is no option. You have to give rogam. So if already given ANC, no need to give rogam. No, you have to give. So answer is false. Stillbirth, if the baby death, do you want to give the rogam? Yes, you have to give rogam. Right? You have to give rogam because stillbirth is the major major reason for the fetal maternal hemorrhage. Because once the baby died, that uh, the endometrial placental barrier will lost and fetal blood can easily enter into the maternal circulation. So if it is an IUD, it's an indication for rogam. So they have mentioned no need to give rogam. So false. You have to give rogam. False. Ruptured ectopic at 10 weeks. Do you want to give? Yes, I told you. Ectopic pregnancy, you have to give rogam. So they mentioned no need. So then it's false. Spon spontaneous miscarriage at nine weeks. For the spontaneous mis miscarriage in first time, Mr. Will you give rogam? No need to give. Because before 12 weeks, the fetal blood volume is very less. Before 12 weeks, the fetal blood volume is very less, which is not enough to stimulate the maternal immune system which is not e enough to stimulate the maternal uh, circulation. So you don't need to give the rogam. So if, if it is the first trimester miscarriage, especially spontaneous miscarriage, you don't need to give the rogam. But if it is a surgical management of uh, 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 miscarriage, you need to give because when you are doing the surgical management, you are damaging the maternal vessels and the fetal blood. So the fetal blood can easily enter into the maternal circulation. Right, so spontaneous miscarriage at nine weeks, you don't need to give. That is true. Ectopic pregnancy managed with methotrexate. Whatever the management for the ectopic, whether it's conservative or medical or surgical, whatever the management, if it is an ectopic, you need to give. You need to give. So here they have mentioned no need to give rogam. That is false. You have to give. Right, so the answer, false, 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 true, false. Right. BSUP score. What is BSUP score? BSUP score is a tool to assess the favorability of the cervix. In case of labor, right, you need to assess whether the cervix is favorable to deliver the baby. If the cervix is not favorable, you have to make the cervix favorable, right? With some medi with some medication or some some mechanical method like induction of labor with uh, uh, prostaglandin or Foley, whatever you can do it, okay. So BSUP score is the tool to assess the favorability of the cervix. This BSUP score has five components. Depend on these five components, we are calculating the score. So what are those five components? One is cervical dilatation. Second, cervical length or effacement. Third one, cervical position. Fourth one, consistency of the cervix. Fifth one, station of the baby, descent of the baby. These are the five components. I am repeating again, cervical dilatation. Second, cervical length or effacement. Third, uh, position of the cervix, whether it's posterior, central or anterior position. Then consistency, firm, soft. Then station of the baby. There are five components in the cervix, in the BSUP score. Actually, you don't need to know how to give the marks, but for the VIVA or MCQ, you need to know what are the component in the BSUP score and what is the maximum score. Then what is the score? It's indicating it's favorable cervix, right? So there are five components in the BSUP score. With this five component, we are calculating the BSUP score of total score. What is the total score of this BSUP score is 12. With this five component, we can't have maximum score of 12. Out of 12, if the score is more than seven, you can say the cervix is favorable. If the score is less than seven, the cervix is not favorable. Do you understand what I'm telling? Right? If the cervix is favorable, it should, the BSUP score should more than seven. If the cervix is unfavorable, BSUP score should be less than seven. Right. So if the BISUP score less than seven, you need to ripen the cervix. You have to make the cervix favorable. To ripen the cervix, you can insert the prostaglandin. You can insert the Foley. 
there are some ways to ripen the cervix if the bishop score is less than 7 if the bishop score is more than 7 cervix is favorable now babe, mother can deliver the baby you can do the arm artificial rupture of membrane and starts into synon with the artificial rupture and starts into synon uterus start to contract and baby will expel out baby will expel out do you understand right so now we will come to the question right now right okay so uh, this of score it's include station of the presenting part true or false yeah that's true station is one of the component it's include length of the cervical canal yes that is also one of the component true it's includes gastration of the fetus whether it's primary or second uh, so multi gastration no it's not include the gastration it's include parity of the mother no it's not depend on the parity falls a score of 9 indicate cervix is unfavorable false if the if it's if the score is less than 7 only you can say it's unfavorable if the score is more than 7 it's 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 favorable so if the score is 9 it's indicate favorable right so the answer is uh, true true false false true so false 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 right Question number ten: Informed written consent before LSCS should include right. What is informed written consent? So all kind of surgical procedures, all kind of surgical procedure before you do the surgical procedure, you need to get the consent permission from the patient, and this consent should be a written form. You need to explain to the patient, right? Make. understand the patient once the patient understood everything you have to write everything on the chit and patient need to read that and finally patient has to sign it okay i accept for the surgical procedure so when you take the informed written consent when you when you talk to the patient when you take the informed written consent what are the component or what are the things you need to you need to explain to the patient one you need to tell what kind of surgery you are going to do i am going to do the cesarean section then second component why are you going to do what is the reason for the cesarean section the reason third one you need to tell the alternative options so even we can go for a instrumental delivery or we can go for something so you need to tell the alternative options because patient has rights to decide say for example if you are going to do the hysterectomy removal of uterus for the dysfunctional uterine bleeding you can tell the alternative option we can resect the endometrium alone we can put the lng ius then patient has right to decide which one i want right so the name of the surgery indication for the surgery alternative options right then you need to mention the complication common complication like while we are doing the cesarean section you can have a uh, bleeding heavy bleeding you can have internal organ damage like bladder damage bowel damage right fetal damage while we are cutting we might cut the baby also but these are very rare complication but still can occur you need to explain the common complications and you need to tell to the patient is there any additional procedure which might need during the surgery because now patient is under anesthesia you are operating something happened say for example patient had a heavy bleeding you need to transfuse the blood that time you can you can't wake up the patient from the anesthesia and get the concern is it okay to transfuse the blood because if the patient is yehova witness for their religious purpose they are not allowing for the blood transfusion you can't transfuse without the patient's consent so you need to get the permission in case of emergency is it okay to give the blood patient need to tell yes doctor you can so if you are suspecting bowel damage and bladder damage you need to tell to the patient so in case of bladder damage we may have to repair the bladder then you have to be on catheter for two weeks or oh, if in case of bowel damage we may have to repair the bowel so then you may have to be on colostomy back for three months so possible complication so if when we are doing the cesarean section if the bleeding is too much of high if we can't stop the bleeding we may have to remove the uterus then you have to explain the possible procedures which might need during the surgery and the finally you need to tell what kind of anesthesia you are going to use for the surgery whether it's a spinal anesthesia whether it's a local anesthesia whether it's a general anesthesia kind of anesthesia type of anesthesia 
these are the things we are explaining and we are getting a written consent from the patient right so in case of category one cesarean section if it is a very urgent cesarean section you don't need to write everything and you don't need to get the consent written consent from the patient you can explain everything to the, to the patient and the doctor can write so these are the things has been explained to the patient and in uh, verbal consent can be has taken that is for the type one or oh, category one cesarean section urgent cesarean section you don't have time then you can take the uh, uh, verbal consent but rest of the things for the elective one always you have to take written consent do you understand okay now we'll come to this question so the informed written consent before lsca should include surgeon name true or false do you want to inform the surgeon who is going to do it yeah false you don't need to tell the surgeon's name whoever can do but surgery name yes indication for surgery yes alternative option yes not the surgeon name right that's false time of the surgery no we are not mentioning the time this time we are going to do no we are not right type of anesthesia true you need to tell what kind of anesthesia we are going to give possible bladder trauma yeah that's true right so possible complication and procedure yes other possible procedure that can have undergone during surgery like uh, hysterectomy blood transfusion uh, bladder damage repair bowel damage repair yeah that is true so answer falls falls two 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 that's all about mcq before we go to the sba do you have any question in mcq straight away we'll go to uh, 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 sba so if the cervix is favorable we don't have to uh, prime by giving dinoplast isn't it yes only arm and syndrome correct senori yes that's correct yeah yeah no break only for 10 mcq sba will will finish this sba and finish it off by 10:30 okay right so the sba right now the mcq actually uh, you have to use your background knowledge and you should know some kind of uh, theory knowledge but in the sba right in addition to your theory knowledge in sba you need to read the question identify the important problems and use your background knowledge and you have to come to the answer right so i will do these 10 question then you will have some idea then when you come to my paper classes then i will train you how to approach this question okay right a 40 year old woman complain of post coital bleeding speculum examination reveal a lesion on the upper lip of the cervix with contact bleeding and surface ulceration what is the next step of management answer please answer please Any answers? Interesting answers. Performs A, uh, performs cervical semia, perform colposcopic directed biopsy, colposcopic directed biopsy. Any answers, please? Right, okay. Never mind. We'll we'll concentrate this question and 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 and, and we'll will we'll, we'll decide the answer. A 40-year-old woman, post-coital bleeding. So here these are the two important words: 40 years. Post coital bleeding. 40 years post coital bleeding. So, if it is 40 years with post coital bleeding, what is your differential diagnosis? What could be the reason for this bleeding? What could be the reason for the cervical cancer? Could be a cervical cancer. Right? So, if it is a cervical cancer, you need to take the biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. So what we have to do, first of all, we have to inspect the cervix. Is there any suspicious lesion, suspicious mass, suspicious ulcers? If there are any suspicious ulcers and mass, then what you can do, you can confirm the malignancy by taking the piece of tissue from the suspicious lesion and you can send for the hysteroscopic or histology examination. Then histopathologist will see under microscope and say, yeah, this is a malignancy. This is your procedure, right? Now, 
So once the history say 40 year old with postcoital bleeding, you are suspecting cervical CA, then you are inspecting the cervix. In the speculum examination that is revealed, there is a lesion in the upper lip with contact bleeding and ulceration. So now I know where is the suspicious lesion. That could be the cervical CA lesion. So then what I want to do, I want to take a piece of tissue from the suspicious lesion for the histopathological examination. Do you understand? So uh, what is the next step of management? Perform cervical semia. What is cervical semia? It's a screening method for the cervical cancer or pre-malignant lesion. So in normal cervix, there might be some pre-malignant lesion like cervical interplasial, interepithelial neoplasia, CIN or HCL or LCL. We will study with the cervical CA. So if it is a pre-malignant lesion, when you see the cervix, the cervix is, looks normal, but you can't, you, there might be some preclinical lesion without symptoms. There might be some lesion. In that case, what we are doing, we are taking the simia to send for the screening test. If the screening positive, then you need to identify the abnormal area, but which is not visualized with the naked eye. So then you have to inspect the cervix with the special instrument called colposcopy. So we do the screening. If the screening positive, we do examination with the help of colposcopy for the normal cervix because we don't know where is the abnormal area. But here the advantage is there is uh, abnormal area. You can see the abnormal area from the naked eye, by the naked eye. So just with the inspection, you can see the abnormal area. So if you, if you can see me, then do you want to use the magnifying glass or do you want to use any equipment to see me? No need. But if it is a micros uh, microscope, uh, uh, small organism like coronavirus, then you have to use some equipment to see the virus. But if it is a human being, no need. You can straight away see and take the biopsy. That's it. So here, this there is a lesion in the cervix. So we know there is a lesion. So if you know the lesion, then take the biopsy from the lesion. That's it. That is the answer. Do you understand? So always you need to read it that properly. So upper lip, perform cervical simia. That is for the screening. That is false. Perform cone biopsy. What is cone biopsy? We are taking the pe piece of cervical and entire cervical canal. So no need to take entire cervical canal. Just take take a piece of tissue from the lesion. Perform wedge biopsy from the lesion. Yeah, that is the answer. Just take a biopsy from the lesion and send for the histopathology. Perform colposcopic directed biopsy. No need of colposcopy because you can see the lesion. If you can't see the lesion, lesion is very microscopic lesion, then you have to use the magnifying machines to identify the abnormal area and take the biopsy. The colposcopy is not needed here. Perform birthing hysterectomy. Before diagnose the lesion, before diagnose the malignancy, we are not going to do the hysterectomy. So that, that answer is no need. So answer for first question is C. Question number two, multiparous patient has cervical dilatation of 5 cm at 8, 8 a.m., 7 cm at 12 noon. She is getting four contraction for 10 minutes. The station of the head is 2 cm above the ischial spine with moderate caput and grade to molding. The membranes are absent. The sacrum is flat and ischial spine are prominent and in curve. The fetal heart rate is 140. What is the most appropriate management? Comments intercinone, comments continuous fetal heart rate monitoring, Comments epidural analgesia and observe for four hours. Improve uh, uh, maternal hydration, perform cesarean section. What is the answer? What is the answer? B, E, A, E, Right. So here, when you read the question, this is what I'm telling you. When you read the question, you need to identify the important problems here. First question, a multiparous patient, right? A multiparous patient. So it means she is a multipara. She already delivered vaginally. Okay. She's a multiparous patient. So she already delivered vaginally. That is the first, first information. So if the mother delivered vaginally previously, 
if the mother delivered vaginally previously, what is it indicating? What is it indicating? Her cervix, so her, 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 her pathway is adequate, right? So in labor, we have studied three things. There are three P's involving with your labor mechanism. What are those three P's? One is power. Second one is passenger. Third one is passage. Power, passenger, and passage. What is power? Your uterine contraction. So during the labor, our target of uterine contraction is three to five contraction in 10 minutes. Second one is passage. Whether your passage is small, inadequate pelvis. Third one is passenger. Sometimes passenger should be in a cephalic presentation with vertex presentation, fully flexed, occipital anterior vertex presentation. That should be the ideal presentation for the delivery. So if the baby is in mild presentation, like a bro presentation, sensiput presentation, face presentation, if it is mild presentation, mild position, occipital posterior position, mild position, which can prolong the labor. So if the labor is getting prolonged, Right. If the uh, labor is getting prolonged, then what you have to do, you have to look for the features. What could be the reason? Whether it's due to power problem, whether it's due to passenger problem, whether it's due to passage problem. But this is a multi patient means she already delivered. So, so the passage is already allowed the baby to come out. Yeah, that is the first information. And cervical dilatation is 5 cm, 7 cm at 8 a.m. Sorry, 5 cm at 8 a.m. and 7 cm at uh, 12 noon. So over 4 hours, the dilatation is 2 cm. Actually, in active phase, our expectation is 1 cm per hour. So it should be 9 cm, but it's 7 cm. It means the progression is not adequate as you expect there is a delay in progression there is a delay in progression okay? the progression is not adequate as you expect so there is a delay in progression okay and when you do the vaginal examination the baby's head is two centimeter above the ischial spine with moderate caput and grade to molding so it means the baby is struggling to come down the space is not adequate. So, and uh, the membranes are absent and she's getting four contraction for 10 minutes. Now, just tell me where could be the problem? Where could be the problem? Is it problem with the power? Is it problem with the power? No, because she's getting 10, four contraction in 10 minutes. So the power is okay. So you don't need to start syntoxinone. You don't need to make the power move. Why? Because she's getting enough contraction. So this lack of progression is unlikely to be due to power. Could it be a problem with the passage? Could be because there is a prominent uh, in curve ischial spine. Could be. But the only weird thing is already she had delivered. So power pro passage problem also less likely because she had vaginal delivery but could be a reason but it's less likely but what about the passenger already her brother or sister elder brother or elder sister already came through this passage right right so already came through this passage so this baby is struggling means so maybe problem with this baby maybe problem with the passenger so baby might be in the mild presentation baby might be in the mild position so what we can do, you don't need to be hurried to deliver the baby until the baby develops distress. So the partogram reached the action line. Still, the baby is in alert line, not the in the action line. Okay. So what you can do, you can wait for some time. The passenger might change the position. Earlier, it, it might be occipital posterior. Now, baby might turn to occipital anterior. Still, you can wait. But patient is getting severe pain, so you can manage the pain and wait for another four hours and see what is happening. After four hours review, if still 
baby is not descending baby is not progressing caput is getting worse or any fetal distress then you may have to go for a cesarean section what if she is multiparous with early cesarean section delivery then there is no question you have to go for a cesarean section if it is multiparous with previously also cesarean section you have to go for a cesarean section here they didn't mention previous cesarean section he said previous vaginal delivery so previous vaginal delivery is a good marker of pelvic adequacy so already she delivered so you don't need to be hurry to deliver the baby so you can wait for some time so answer is going to be comments epidural and observe for another 4 hours because she's getting four contraction and severe pain just give the pain relief right comments epidural and review in 4 hours so now you all understand how the answer is varying depend on the case so answer is c question number 3 a primary para is admitted to the labor room cervix is 50 percentage fs and dilatation is 2 cm she is getting two contraction uh, uterine contraction for 10 minutes artificial rupture of membrane done and oxytocin infusion commons progression of the labor is carefully observed what is the best parameter for the progression of labor so they have induced the labor what is the best parameter to assess the progression of labor what are the parameters we are using to assess the progression of labor there are two two parameters we are uh, assessing uh, uh, to assess the uh, uh, progression what are those two parameters one is dilatation of the cervix and second one is descent of the baby so the best parameter is dilatation of the cervix so answer is uh, dilatation of the cervix assess after 4 hour not 2 hour the frequent vaginal examination is not, not recommended during the labor because whenever you put the vaginal examination put your finger into the vagina repeatedly it might uh, 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 introduce the organism so that's why you have to do the vaginal examination every 4 hours so dilatation of the cervix assessed by 4 hours it's the best way to assess the progression of labor a primary mother who, who attend to antenatal clinic wish to know the symptoms of onset of labor which one of the following is correct answer to her question so we know so the labor has a characteristic pain characteristic symptom right answer c colicky abdominal pain and back pain which not relieved by analgesia yeah. so then why are i giving uh, epidural why are i giving pethidine why are i giving uh, uh, this one so the labor has characteristic pain what is the characteristic pain of labor bilateral colicky abdominal pain intermittent pain increasing in intensity increasing in frequency increasing in duration bilateral colicky abdominal pain increasing in frequency duration and intensity frequency duration and intensity associated with blood strain vaginal discharge and watery vaginal discharge associated with blood strain vaginal discharge and watery vaginal discharge changed and associated with blood strain vaginal discharge and plus or minus or with or without watery vaginal discharge so if you know the definition so then answer is c colicky abdominal pain and backache with increasing in frequency intensity and uh, duration with time that is the uh, characteristic pain of the labor question number 5 a 25 year old primary whose attempt uh, at antenatal whose uh, antenatal period was uncomplicated is in active phase of labor in first stage of labor vaginal examination reveals cervical dilatation of 5 cm with absent membrane pelvis is adequate fetal heart rate is 135 beats per minute a decision made to perform the cesarean section which one of the following finding is most likely cause for this decision what could be the reason for the cesarean section yeah baby is in bro presentation because bro presentation can't deliver vaginally because the diameter of bro presentation is around 13 cm but your pelvis is 11 cm so through the pelvic diameter this 13 cm baby will not enter into the pelvis so then you may have to go for a cesarean section so here is an 
uncompleted. So the question too, because this is prominent displacement, can we take it as CPD? That's why I explained in question two, prominent scale spine, can we take it as CPD? That's why I told you, she's a multiparous woman. She already delivered vaginally. So uh, even though it's a prominent scale spine, which can cause the CPD, but already she delivered. It means she has proven her pelvis is adequate to deliver her baby. So then if, if, the, if the baby is not delivering, even after crossing the action line, you can do cesarean section. Even it's not crossing the action line, why you want to be hurry to do section? You can, you have time to wait and see what is happening. That's why we take it as a, a review in four hours. Okay, right. So here, this is 25 year old primary mother with uncomplicated pregnancy, vaginal examination, five centimeter, everything is normal, but they wanted to do cesarean section because it's a broke presentation. It's not, not contraindicated at all. It's not, it's contraindicated for the vaginal delivery. It's not possible to vaginal delivery. So, uh, approximation of suture line is uh, grade one molding. The grade one molding is normal. You don't need to do cesarean section for the grade one molding. Palpation of the anterior fundal layer and sagittal suture, it's, 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 it's normal. You don't need to deliver the cesarean section. Palpation of the eye, nose and mouth, that is your face presentation. Face presentation, you can deliver vaginally. It's, 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 it's not a problem. Palpation of the frontal bone and supraorbital roach. So then if you can feel the frontal bone and supraorbital ridge, it is a bro presentation, then it's not possible for the vaginal delivery. That's why they decided to go for a cesarean section. Presence of caput, caput also may be normal during pregnancy. So the answer is D. Question number six, a primary para complain of severe pain in the vagina. Primary mother, she delivered baby. She's complaining of vaginal pain one hour after the delivery she delivered after one hour she's complaining of severe vaginal pain on examination she's pale her pulse rate is 120 beats per minute her blood pressure is 90 by 60. vaginal examination reveal large soft boogie mass in the right lateral vaginal wall what is the most appropriate management can you just tell me uh, what is the diagnosis this one why she is having that uh, uh, bogey mass? That is called yes, that is called a vaginal hematoma. Vaginal hematoma, right? So after the delivery, one hour after the delivery, she is complaining vaginal pain, and in the examination, she is pale, tachycardic, and hypotension. It means she is bleeding a lot. So bleeding is somewhere else, right? So in the examination, they have seen there is a big, large mass in the vagina. It means when the baby is delivering in the vaginal mucosa, there is a vessel damage. Through the damage vessel, the bleeding is collecting inside the vagina. When the vaginal mucosa is getting collected with the blood, there will be a blood collection called hematoma. So it means there is a bleeding into the tissue. That is your hematoma. When there is an extravasation, bleeding into the tissue, what will happen? The intravascular blood volume will come down and patient will be pale, patient will be tachycardic, patient will be hypotension. So that is the reason. So if there is a bleeding through the vessels and collecting inside, what you want to do? You want to arrest the bleeding. How can you arrest the bleeding? You need to identify which vessel is bleeding. Once you identify the bleeding vessels, then you have to tie that vessels. So once you diagnose the perineal hematoma, immediately you have to take the patient to the theater, open up the hematoma, evacuate the blood, identify the bleeding vessels, and you have to tie the bleeding vessels to arrest the bleeding. Do you understand? So then only bleeding will stop. So here, this is a vaginal hematoma, which lead uterine or patient hemodynamic instability. So resuscitate the patient, take the patient and explore the hematoma and identify the bleeding vessel. So drain and explore the bleeding vessel will be the correct answer. Once you explore the bleeding vessel, you can arrest the bleeding by tying the vessels. So answer is B. Question number seven, what is the most appropriate so answer for Five, fifth question. D. 
Question number seven. What is the most appropriate test to determine the fetal maternal hemorrhage following delivery? Now, as we discussed earlier, right? <coughs> Sorry. When the baby is delivering, this fetal blood can easily enter into the maternal circulation. When the baby is delivered, the fetal blood can easily enter into the maternal circulation. When the fetal blood enter into the maternal circulation, the maternal immune system will recognize this fetal blood as foreign body and which will produce the antibody against the fetal blood. That is called fetal maternal hemorrhage and fetal uh, sensitization for the fetal blood. Right. So before I explain the question number seven, the one one person is asking a question, sir. In question number six, sir, uh, here the patient is almost in shock. So isn't it the first thing is transfusion? Okay. Read this question carefully. Here they have asked, what is the most appropriate management? That is the first part. Second part, of course, patient need blood transfusion. I agree, but the Read the later part of the particular statement. Transfuse the blood and keep under observation. So without arresting, are you going to keep this mother under observation? Yes, answer is wrong. Of course, you need to give the blood. I agree. But after the blood transfer, while you are giving the blood transfusion, you have to arrest the bleeding. Otherwise, giving, 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 giving with the whole, whole bucket, it's, it's coming out, right? So no point. So we are not going to keep this mother under observation. So we need to give the blood at the same time. We need to do the intervention. So transfuse and keep under observation is wrong. That's why the answer is wrong. Okay, right. So if the maternal blood, uh, uh, fetal blood enter into the maternal circulation, so it might stimulate the immune system. That's why what you want to do, you want to neutralize the fetal blood, which is entered into the maternal, entered into the maternal blood. So to neutralize it, you need to give the raw gum. So if you want to neutralize the one neutralize one milliliter of fetal blood to neutralize one milliliter of fetal blood you need to give 125 international unit of raw gum okay so if one milliliter fetal blood entered into the maternal circulation you need to give 125 milliliter of raw gum to neutralize it so depend on the amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage you need to calculate how much of rogam you are going to give to the mother to neutralize it. Say, for example, if it is four milliliter of fetal maternal hemorrhage, then you have to give 500 international unit. If it is eight milliliter of fetal maternal hemorrhage, then you need to give thousand international unit. So first of all, you need to calculate the fetal maternal hemorrhage. Then you have to calculate how much of rogam you need to give. Then only we are giving the rogam. Okay. So now we have a question, how to calculate the amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage. So there are ways to calculate the fetal maternal hemorrhage. One, you can do flow cytometry. Second, you can do Glehova test. These are the two tests we do to calculate the fetal maternal hemorrhage, right? So in flow cytometry is the best method, but which is not the available in Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, the method available to assess the fetal maternal hemorrhages, fetal maternal hemorrhages, Clehova test. So what we are doing is we are taking the maternal blood and do the Clehova test. Then Clehova test will tell how much of fetal blood is in the maternal blood. So then Clehova test will guide you. The maternal blood has 8 ml of fetal blood. So then you have to give thousand international unit program. So the best way to assess the fetal maternal hemorrhage is to do the Glehova test to the maternal blood. The answer is B. Question number eight. An 18 year old woman in the first pregnancy presented with blood pressure of 140, 110, reduced fetal movement, acute onset of severe abdominal pain, possible cause. What is the answer?
right? So here, when you read this question, you need to gather some information. One, 18 years, teenage mother. First pregnancy, the prime here. And blood pressure, 110, 110. So this is a PIH. This is high risk for the PIH as it is a primary and teenage. And patient present with reduced fetal movement and acute onset of severe persistent abdominal pain. So in pregnancy, patient is presenting with continuous abdominal pain could be due to abduction or uterine rupture, right? Continuous, if it is an intermittent abdominal pain, it could be due to labor. If it is a persistent severe abdominal pain, could be due to abruption, separation of placenta before delivery. Second one is uterine rupture. Now, for this patient, what is the reason? Whether it's placental abruption or uterine rupture? Here, the uterine rupture is less likely because this is a primary mother. She does not have any history of previous cesarean section. So uterine rupture is less likely. But she has hypertension. So hypertension, PIH, is a risk factor for placental abruption. The reason is, what is the reason for the placental abruption? PIH is, there is a problem with the placental implantation. Placenta is not invading into the endometrium properly. If there is an improper implantation, this placenta can easily separate. So if a PIH patient, placental abruption risk is a bit high. Do you understand? So considering these risk factors, she's a primary mother with PIH, it's less likely to be uh, uterine rupture. So it's high likely to be an abruption. So possible cause is placental abruption, answer A. Question nine. A 38 year old multiparous woman presented with menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, with outlast the period. Abdominal vaginal examination reveal uniformly enlarged uterus corresponding to size of 14 weeks pregnancy Ultrasound reveal a uniformly enlarged uterus with marked myometrial thickening. No other pelvic pathology was detected. She was, uh, she, her recent cervical simia was normal. What is the most appropriate management? What is the most appropriate management, please? What is the most appropriate management? Okay, just before we come to the management, just tell me what is the diagnosis this one what is the diagnosis endometriosis no this is the adenomyosis right what is adenomyosis adenomyosis mean presence of endometrium into the myometrium presence of endometrium into the myometrium when the endometrium present into the myometrium each and every cycle when the patient is uh, 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 when the patient is uh, uh, having menstrual cycle, the endometrium start to bleed into the myometrium, into the muscles. When the endometrium bleed into the myometrium, patient will have severe pain. And the bleeding into the myometrium will cause inflammation of the myometrium. So blood supply to the myometrium will increase. And contractility of the myometrium will reduce. So then they start to bleed a lot. So patient will have menorrhagia, heavy bleeding. Patient will have severe pain, dysmenorrhea. And when the endometrium is uh, inflamed and uh, thickened, so it start to swell. So then what will happen? Your myometrium thickness will going to increase and uterine size is going to increase. So uterus is going to be enlarged. Uterus is going to be enlarged. Enlarged uterus. Right? Usually it's globular in shape with tenderness, regular period with severe pain. Right? These are the characteristic feature of adenomyosis. So this patient has all features suggestive of adenomyosis. 
severe bleeding, menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, enlarged uterus, globular uterus, thickened myometrium. So it's an adenomyosis. So if it is an adenomyosis, what is the best treatment? Where is the pathology? Pathology is in the uterus. She's 35 years. So if she want permanent solution for these things, what you want to do, you want to take the uterus out. Now we have a question. Is it, is it important to take the ovary also or only uterus? If you take the ovary at 35 years, patient will have premature ovary and failure and she will have symptoms suggestive of premature menopausal symptoms. There are a lot of complications. So you need to decide, do I want to take the ovary as well or do I want to take the uterus only? Here, the pathology is basically with only with the uterus, not with the ovary. So if the ovary is innocent, does not have any problem, then why you want to take the ovary? Just leave the ovary, take the uterus only. Right, so now we'll read the question again. A 38 year old multiparous woman presented with menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, which outlasts the period, abdominal vaginal examination reveal uniformly enlarged uterus corresponding to a size of 14 weeks pregnancy. Ultrasound scan revealed uniformly enlarged uterus with marked myometrial thickening. No other pelvic pathology was detected. The recent cervical simia was normal. What is the most appropriate? Hysteroscopic resection of endometrium. No point in resecting the endometrium because the problem is in the myometrium. Myometrium, yeah, actually you don't need to do the myometrium because if it is a fibroid, we have to do the myometrium. This is not a fibroid, this is an adenomyosis. So myometrium, it's not an option. Subtotal hysterectomy. Nowadays, subtotal hysterectomy is not recommended. Earlier, yes. Now, it's not. Total abdominal hysterectomy, yes. That will be the best option. Total abdominal hysterectomy plus bilateral salvingo oophorectomy. It means you need to remove the ovary as well. You don't need to remove the ovary. So, answer for question number 9 is D. Question number 10. A 30-year-old mother of three presented to the clinic in PO of 10 weeks with mild abdominal pain and pervaginal bleeding. Uterus enlarged, 14 to 16 week size, and ultrasound confirmed complete hydrative form. What is the most appropriate option? Now, here you can see she is 10 weeks of POA, but the uterus is 14 to 16 week size. So the fundus, the uterine size is more than the period of gastration. So something is problem inside the uterus. Okay. Something is problem with the inside the uterus because the abnormal pregnancy, don't worry, I will teach you the tropoblastic disease, abnormal pregnancy, right? Abnormal pregnancy, getting proliferate more, the tropoblastic, the placental cells are proliferating more as a molar pregnancy. So what is the problem with the molar pregnancy? This molar pregnancy can convert as malignant. So these molar pregnancies are pre-malignant lesion. So from these tropoblastic cells, from these placental cells, the malignant transformation can occur. What kind of malignancy? That is called choriocarcinoma, malignancy in the placental cells. Choriocarcinoma risk is very high from the molar pregnancy. So if you diagnose the molar pregnancy, then what you have to do, you, are, you have to remove entire product, this abnormal placental cells from the endometrium. But you don't need to take the uterus out because this is not the malignancy. This is the pre-malignant lesion. For the pre-malignant lesion, you, know, you don't need to do the hysterectomy. But you need to completely remove the abnormal pregnancy part. If you leave this pre-malignant abnormal pregnancy part, that can convert as choriocarcinoma. Now we have a question, how we are going to remove this product? So usually what we do is we are just cropping and removing this product out. That is called your DNA. But the DNA, or oh, you can make the uterus to contract to expel out. That is your medical management. For this abnormal pregnancy, for this pre-malignant lesion, this DNA and medical management are not recommended. The reason is when you make the uterus to contract, uterus is contracting and relax, contracting and relax. When the uterus contract, this pre-malignant lesion will separate from the uterus. When it is relaxed, now the uterine blood vessels are kept open. 
this premalignant lesion can easily enter into the maternal circulation and which can spread to the distant areas and it can implant into the brain it can implant into the lungs and causing metastatic lesion that's why the medical management can cause metastasis that's why the medical management is not recommended for tropoblastic disease at the same time if you do the dna by scrapping if you remove it what will happen you are going to damage the maternal tissue as well as the fetal tissue through this damaged maternal tissue this fetal tissue can easily enter into the maternal circulation and can spread do you understand can spread so this is not a good option to do dna it is not a good option to do dna so then what you have to do of course you need to remove everything without damaging the maternal tissue then what you can do you can use the suction to evacuate you just insert the sucker inside while you are inserting the sucker with the negative pressure if everything will be sucked out without damaging or without pushing into the maternal circulation so if it is a pre malignant lesion best option to remove the pre malignant lesion without spreading into the maternal circulation is suction evacuation so suction evacuation is the management of choice for the tropoblastic disease not only that once you remove the product by suction evacuation you need to make sure you have completely removed the entire product how to do that you need to do the beta hcg serial assessment because if there is a placental tissue inside that will produce beta hcg once you remove everything what will happen the beta hcg level will come down up to the negative so after the suction evacuation we need to follow the patient with beta hcg until it become negative this is how we are managing the tropoblastic disease so answer for question number 10 is suction evacuation dilatation curatage is the way of taking bath see misoprostol i told you you can't use uh, 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 medical management oxytocin infusion again i told you you can't make the uterus to contract hysterectomy no need of hysterectomy you have to do the suction evacuation now you you might understand what are we going to discuss in the paper class so we have studied all the things right so we have uh, already uh, 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 studied all the things now we are applying those questions with a question okay now the question number 2 some students are having still quite doubt so uh, in question number 2 it's not said that she delivered through the vagina earlier so have they mentioned that she delivered by cesarean section no so if they are not mentioning Uh, cesarean section then you have to take it as vaginal delivery multiparous means she delivered vaginally uh, can you please repeat the sensitizing event in rh conflict mm -hmm. question number 8 in the patient has abduction can be the bp still high uh, in question number 8 if the patient has abduction can bp still high yeah yeah can because she is a pih patient right okay so the sensitizing event there are five sensitizing event in first trimester recurrent threatened miscarriage threatened miscarriage with abdominal pain surgical management of miscarriage ectopic pregnancy partial tropoblastic disease partial tropoblastic disease then the second trimester or third trimester sensitizing events are one is um, uh, any kind of miscarriage in second trimester and after antepartum hemorrhage ecv abdominal trauma invasive procedure like uh, right invasive procedure like um, uh, 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 co codosynthesis amniocentesis chorionic pillar sampling and uh, iud intrauterine fetal death and any kind of delivery like normal vaginal delivery vacuum delivery right cesarean section those are the sensitizing event so question number 8 how to exclude the placenta previa because placenta previa is uh, usually painless bleeding not the painful bleeding so will there be a topic wise revision of course i told you i will start the topic wise revision uh, by end of this month okay so once we finish the theory class 
so before you go to the exam i will revise everything in a nutshell in a precise manner you will be masters in obzan gaini if you come to my class you don't need to worry any question so i will uh, give the access to of this class for the students who couldn't attend today class because of the university lectures and all i will i'll share the link you can go through the classes and uh, uh, we will start the mixed paper today as routine we will finish uh, the theory class by next week we will start the session 3 at the same time we will start the paper paper discussion like this paper discussion like this uh, from the next week 